This 2019 Golf R is one of my most prized possessions. Draped in Ginster yellow as part of the VW Spectrum series, it holds a very special place in my heart. For most of us car enthusiasts, we've had that one car that just gets a hold of us. Sadly, a fender bender totaled the car and it sat collecting dust for over a year. Until now. We are going to resurrect this thing and make it bigger, badder, and better than ever. We'll completely restore the wrecked quarter panel, do a 2.5 liter turbo swap from an Audi RS3, and outfit the car with a bunch of other modifications to truly make this one of a kind. We're setting out to build the most epic Mark 7 Golf R anyone has ever seen. So join me for what is surely going to be a wild ride. Finally, it's time to begin, starting with the bodywork. It may seem like this has taken forever to get going, but there is a really important reason why we waited. My good buddy Juan was in the process of building his own body shop, and now that he's open, it's time to bring him the car. So, we're gonna get it over there, but before I do that, I'm gonna pull a couple of bits out of the interior, including the back seat, both rear seat belts, a few other things. I'm even gonna get the headliner out of the way, or the back part of it anyway, so that they can do this repair much, much easier. Okay, we've done all we can do here. Now it's time to load it up and take it over the wand and let him work his neck. Now, of course, this is just a Golf, but it's my Golf, and I absolutely love this car. Plus, I bought it back from the insurance company for $6,500. That means we have a really good budget to fix and modify this car. After getting the car to Premier Auto Body, Juan's new shop, he and I game plan about what it's gonna take to get this car fixed. Not only is Juan the one that checked out the car right after the accident, he is also an auto body master and artiste, so I know that my car is in good hands. Juan told me he can get this car about 98% back to how it was when it was new, and since I'm way out of my element here, I'm just as excited to see that happen as you are. While Juan gets things ready to start on the yellow car, let's get back to my shop for the second piece of this puzzle. And just like that, here it is, our 2018 RS3. It's pretty obvious when you look at it why it was totaled out. The driver's side's all smushed in. But that's not why we got it. We got it for the heart that's underneath the hood. This is our Daza engine. This is a common term used for the 2.5 liter in the RS3 and the TTRS. From the factory, it's rated for 400 horsepower and 350 pound foot of torque, which is a huge jump over the Golf R's 288 horsepower. Now with software and a few bolt-ons from our friends at Unitronic, we should get about 600 horsepower, nearly double of a stock Mark 7 Golf R. Now, according to the auction site, this car was supposed to run and drive. However, it doesn't even start or try to. So before we do anything, we have to figure out why. That's why buying cars from auction sites is always going to be a big gamble, because you never know exactly what could be going on? A blown engine, damage underneath, cracking the block. The list is endless. Paul's got me scared like it's cold outside. Let's scan it and see if this will uh, point us in the right direction of why our poor RS3 won't start. I am done working out here in the cold, so why don't we push this thing in the shop and stop standing out here? That's fair. Right, let's get it in the shop so Pauly D doesn't have to be chilly boy. <laughs> Push her in. Push it, push it. Push real it real good. good. Oh, this went harder than I expected.
Okay, after a brief scan, all this red right here on the screen, those are all the faults. And it actually looks like we cannot communicate with the engine, the transmission, the all wheel drive electronicals, and that's it. So that's likely why our car doesn't start. I'm gonna poke at this and see what else I can find. Now, a long list of faults like that can lead you to be scared about all the things that could be wrong with the car and maybe chase your tail. But you gotta start with what you believe to be the most likely issue and kind of pare down from there. And since we had airbag deployment <laughs> as Paul's trying to just make a disaster out of this. I did, <laughs> you're gonna go flying. <laughs> Watch out uh, for that. Oh, sorry. You. But I did find a fault for the igniter or the battery interrupt. This car has the battery in the trunk and there's a pyrotechnic device that'll blow in case of a collision. So we're gonna check that pyrotechnic and see if that's why we have no comm with modules as well as our car won't crank and of course won't start. So this is a multimeter. We're gonna check for voltage. So you can see if we go here, you can see that there's 11.53 volts in the battery. And then if you go over here, same thing, you're gonna see 11.53 volts. Right here is a solenoid that disconnects in the case of an accident or could disconnect. So if you look here, we do not have 12 volts there, which is why this car won't start. Okay, so what I think we can do is actually jump that pyro device and hopefully try and start this car up. We jump straight from the positive here over to this cable, which is what runs to the front of the car. And then he should be able to start her up. That is a huge relief. And yes, nothing is better to do than start a car cold. Yeah. And just hammer the throttle. Frozen cold, just rev it straight to the moon. Now that we know that our Audi starts and runs, let's swing over and check in on the Golf. I'm also gonna bring a bunch of parts over to Juan so that he can get started. Just like that. So we're here at Premier Auto Body. As you can see, my Golf R is right behind me. That's Juan. He's getting the interior all taped up. Now, there's already been a little work done to this car up to this point. We did the initial frame pull a long time ago. Juan's got some of the parts already removed, the door, the bumper cover, but this is it. This is where the action starts to happen. We also have a shelf full of parts right here. Bumper cover, wheel liner bits, the outer quarter panel and a handful of other things. Let's check in with Juan and see how this repair is gonna go down. But yeah, all these little little inventions that you see inside the outer wheelhouse are designed to absorb an impact like this. Right. So yes, this, this could have actually went in a little bit further if it weren't for all this stuff. We're looking at the car now after I've done what's called the rough pull, which was when we clamped it, set it up, and then pulled everything to kind of get it back into some kind of shape. The original one, so. if you look inside of here, it's completely destroyed. If we don't put that back in, we're not going to have the structural safety aspect of it. Well, not only that, I imagine by the time you hammered and <laughs> the metal's thin. It's 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 not. It's, it's not going to be it's right. It's not. It's one thing to hammer and dolly a spot this big. It's a completely, completely <laughs> different. Do the pull back it's a completely of different thing <laughs> to do the whole thing. And that's absolutely not what we're doing here. Now, this might look like a really big, scary piece of the car. I mean, look, this is a lot of metal of the car, but Juan has like the Volkswagen proper way to make these repairs. So uh -huh. He's got it all lined up and dialed in to where the cuts are going to be made on the car, remove panels. We're not going to use the entire thing. I think we're going to omit this. All those crumple zones that Juan talked about are also so for strength. Absolutely. So slows down the metal crushing in an impact, but it also provides strength. So if we want it right, this is a forever car for me. This is dope, dude. I'm excited. I'm yeah. so excited about yeah, this. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to fix it, man. It's gonna be a really cool, cool adventure on this car. I think we're gonna be all right. So the next step, obviously after this, is gonna be to set the car up, cut the quarter off. We've got the car up on the frame machine. I am actually gonna set it up just because I know the car is gonna be here for a little bit. I like the ability to have it set up and kind of on clamps. It's not a necessary thing. It's something that I just want to do. We are going to cut the old outer wheelhouse completely off. We're going to mock it up and this piece is going to go onto the car and uh, pretty much after that it's put the quarter back on. Not a super super crazy repair. I know it does look very scary but it's really not. Sounds like the next step for me is to get the hell up one's way so he can actually do some work. <laughs> All right, let's go. He put me to work. Look at this. I'm having to do my own work out here. Charles, come on. 
Come on, just a quickie. I just want you to look at this in the wheelhouse. Oh yeah. Ooh. People were saying we should uh, fix that. <laughs> <laughs> that is why it's getting replaced. With the car locked off on the frame machine, it's time to dig in. Sometimes you get lucky, but often you can't know the full damage until looking behind the curtain. So step one is going to be removing the outer quarter panel to see the sadness behind it. We knew the car had a lot of damage to it because that first estimate was over $33,000. You can really see just how smashed up things are when you see them right next to a brand new panel. Now we found some surprises on the Golf, but let's get back to the Audi and hope we find exactly zero surprises. Okay, so now we're gonna reposition the car, put it on a lift so we can give it a proper once over, make sure it's all good everywhere else. So the next place we're gonna start looking at is gonna be under the hood. We're looking for any inconsistencies, problems, things missing, et cetera. We're gonna check the oil. oil. <laughs> well, it has oil in it, so. Yeah. yeah. We are missing an engine cover, and I'm also noticing peculiarities, that's a word, like this clamp isn't tight, as if someone maybe swap seated. I'm also noticing this problematic piece. That's actually a real problem. Yeah, this is a downstream O2. It looks like it got nuked. Maybe it shorted and just fried. It doesn't look really like fried. So maybe they did have a downpipe and swapped it back out. When we get the car up, we'll look at the exhaust and make that determination. But again, ultimately it doesn't like really matter. All that stuff's gonna be replaced anyway. What likely happened is they had an intake, they had a turbo inlet, the car got wrecked, totaled, and they're like, oh crap, let me swap back my factory thing, which they probably did a better job than like 95% of people would. <laughs> I mean, uh, because they actually did it. Not a big deal. We got some modified go fast funzy parts coming from Unitronic. I did reach out to Unitronic and this car was stage two ECM, but doesn't seem to have the hardware to back it up. So hopefully it wasn't ragged on too terribly bad. Now you might be wondering why I decided to do the Daza swap over some of the other really awesome engine choices out there. And there's a couple of reasons. One, you guys, when I posted the yellow car wreck video, that was the overwhelming comment. Two, this is a swap that while it has been done before, it's not super common. And three, I thought buying a wrecked RS3 would be really fun and exciting. And we get to see two cars smashed together is pretty awesome. So I'm yeah. so thankful we got it running. I think we should get it up in the air and look at the bottom side. Going up. Oh good, look at, look at those wheel weights. Look at how crooked <laughs> they are. They should be in a straight line, just like in a straight line along here. A blind person would put on wheel weights better than this. So after a look underneath the car, everything looks pretty solid. There are some crustiness in these rear lower control arms. Paul's pulling the belly pan so we can look on the engine side. There's a couple of things that I'll likely end up replacing in the suspension, and it probably could stand to have some new bushings because this car has 70,000 miles on it, which I'm not really happy about the mileage, but it is what it is. Oh. Oh, good. If you look right here, this directs air up at the turbo in the back. And your oil then leaks down and forward. Well, that's, yeah, it helps the oil <laughs> leak down the other direction too. So we do have a little bit of an oil leak back here at the back of the pan. It's dry up above. We'll reseal it, I think, after we put it in the Golf. Some of the things Charles is gonna wanna keep on this car as he's gonna be swapping everything over. The brakes on RS3s are gonna be much better. The subframe's gonna be lighter. And then obviously the rest of the drivetrain, he's gonna be swapping the full drivetrain, including the rear end. What about the nitrous kit? We're not putting nitrous on no. our, our nitrous experience has been poor so far. Probably not in an engine that costs 15 grand to buy a used one. Something else that's cool about the RS3 that I think we already mentioned is that it has the battery in the back. So we have this cable that we're gonna transfer over to. Basically, I'm excited we don't have to run it through this dumb frame rail. So RS3s are actually really good cars. A few common problems that can happen on them, and I wouldn't call this common, but common enough, people who heavily modify them can blow up the engine. Uh, they can sometimes burn oil. There is an issue with the valve on the front for the after run coolant pump where that can actually short out causing it to melt wires and there can be issues with bevel boxes drive shafts rear differentials and other drivetrain components like that all right so we have an update one pulled this piece off right here to reveal even more unseen damage this right here was crushed you could see it a little bit right here but you couldn't see it until we got that panel off so i had already ordered this piece as well as this whole back bit for this car this is why you can't look at a picture on the internet or a quick video 
and determine what exactly is wrong with the car, even if you have 800 years experience being a mechanic and think that the Toyota Celica from 1992 is the best car ever made and the only one you should ever buy. You just can't know certain things till you do some teardown or actually see it in person. So I don't wanna say it's good that we keep having to buy more parts, but what is good is we're definitely on the right path to having this car fixed 100% proper, so this is a good thing. I'm hyped. A vital part of that 100% perfection is doing a ton of test fitting. This gives Juan the chance to properly place each panel and make any adjustments that are needed. If you're off like two millimeters here, you might be off five millimeters when you put on the outer quarter panel. So the 95 clamps that Juan is using is definitely not overkill. Once everything is properly mocked up, it comes off and we're moving to the paint booth. This is a step that you will rarely see in collision repair shops, but we are doing this extra bit for a couple of reasons. One, this will give us better protection and rust proofing down the road, and all of this equipment is brand new, so they're using this as a test and to shake out all the new stuff. Plus, it looks awesome, and watching all these little spinny dealies is super cool. I don't know why this made me think of, but there was some wrestler that used to like do a jump and he would, he would like do that. Maybe he that threw was his, like his move. He threw his gat, his gat into, the, he, into the door. He would just gat right into the car like that. <laughs> Maybe that's what happened. What, so, okay, but like for real though, this is kind of a weird, unique bit of impact pole. <laughs> what do you think happened to this thing? It does kind of look like a pole. That That's my guess is that the uh, headmasters were not up to the task. I think that's rubber, dude. It's crunchy up here. Oh, what is that? That's paint. That's black paint. This is like CSI crime dun, dun, dun. Dun. This is like, is it? There's also like a rip. Maybe it was a Wolverine. The driver of this car, let's just call him Giuseppe. He's going to work, probably listening to classical music because you know, somebody who owns a car like this, they're a classy person. He hits a patch of ice. Ooh. To his left, oh. Nissan Altima. One spare tire, broken tail light, bumper hanging off. He swerves, Giuseppe's losing it. Spins around, pull. I, I mean, Probably, that's that's probably what happened. Moral of the story is, avoid some head kinks. Now, while it's been fun speculating of what happened and Paul's uh, very moderately accurate story, this is some pretty interesting damage that's very low. Our car is low, so it likely did hit a pole of some kind. Overall, our RS3 is in great shape for what we plan to do with it. And here's a list of the things that are likely going to get swapped from the RS3 to my Golf R. We have the engine and transmission. We have the rear diff, the gas tank, the battery, cabling and most likely the seats. There might also be a handful of other parts that end up making it to the Golf, but those are gonna be the main things we swap over. So I'm gonna start by taking off this pyrotechnic stuff, but I gotta get all this foam out of the way first. So while Paul's doing the pyrotechnics back there, I'm gonna work on getting our door off so we can actually drive this car. Uh, look at us, look how smashed that is. That's a maraca. Here's our pyrotechnic. This connects from the airbag system and this is what connects the battery together. So this guy pops in the case of an accident, boop, and then these are no longer connected. Here is our pyrotechnic that Paul removed from the back of our RS3. And I've never seen how these actually work. So of course I took it apart. I'll show you guys what this actually does. This here is a static connection. It's just a like a strip of metal. Power comes in and just goes right out. Well, when the airbag deploys to cut power to the rest of the car, there's a little explosion loader in here that shoots up this tiny piece of plastic and it physically breaks the connection of this little power bar. So you're probably not gonna fix this reasonably. How awesome is it that I actually had one instead of having to spend like 300 something dollars to replace this thing? Let's try and put this in and see if we can. Okay, so we might even be able to fix this today. Today. So Paul, when you get that hooked back up, let's try it with it unplugged and see if it works. Cause I don't think the airbag module in the Golf has provision for that piece. You got Got it, dude. Thanks, bro. Okay, now we get the front door off. Whoa, it's heavy, and I don't want to scratch it. How do we? How do I? How do I look like? Oh, this? that looks like you how belong I, in woo, there, man. Woo. Let's go for a ride. Let's see what happens. Fire up. We did it. Is that with the pyro unplugged? Unplugged. Hell yeah! If that had to be plugged in in order to work, 
uh, likely we would have just bypassed it. But now that we know it doesn't have to be plugged in, it's gonna leave it as is. Good to go. We're in a pretty good spot with the RS3, and you have all seen the progress of the yellow car. However, our man Paulie D has not. He's also got some panels that he needs to get put on. So uh, what do you say we take a trip to the body shop? Let's do it. He can Paul install at the body shop too. I'm not installing anything. Put it in, Paul. While Paul and I have been screwing around with the Audi, Juan has been doing the real work. He's been test fitting all of our panels and trimming where needed, marking, sanding, and overall prepping for the gluey and the weldy, and creating a really nice little pile of yellow scrap. So this is a gap gauge. It allows us to make sure that we can check our gaps from side to side and uh, that we have even gaps. Three mil there. Beautiful. And here we go. Would ya? Wow. Look at it that. It is chopped apart, huh? Yeah. This is what a golf looks like with half the back end missing. Well, <laughs> this is a panel I specifically installed myself. Yeah, this is from shopdap.com, all install. It, yeah, I- You put it in? I did, I put it in. I couldn't do any of this, but I would, I would screw it up royally. Oh, completely. Okay, so this is the first time I've seen this car. Obviously it is cut apart quite a bit. <laughs> the amount of things that are required to properly repair a car is crazy. And obviously that's what translates back to the RS3. The amount of damage that was on the yellow car when it was first in the accident it didn't look like it was that bad but when you look at the repair you have to cut apart the whole side of the car the whole back of the car all that sheet metal has to be then reworked re-welded back onto the car so if you translate that to what would have to happen with the rs3 it would be huge which was far worse yes. structurally than what's wrong with my golf my question for you is do you think you could fix that in an equivalent manner to I, how it's being repaired i could fix it <laughs> this is what he would do <laughs> To the uh, crusher. It's really cool. I'm glad that we were able to come by here so you yeah. can see the car in its repair state. But I think we got more work to do on the RS3. So let's go back to the shop. Woo. Show the friends at home how there's not gonna be a seatbelt. No, nope, 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 yeah. It is. Yeah, this by We're not moving nothing. This is like Akon. Locked up, I won't let me out. Make sure there's nothing in the trash. It looks, it's fine until you get to the part where it has to dip down. That's where it's a problem. Sorry. <laughs> So it's actually a really good point showing that the sunroof is damaged. Our collision down here on the left has sent a ripple effect through the car and broken something at the top, completely on the other side. And you can even see how the roof line is all wavy now because of that accident. Now you might think this car should be fixed because the damage doesn't look that bad. But if you take a look here, you can see that this thing has been pushed in really far. Now this damage that pushed in here into the pillar here transmits all the way up, it wrinkled the pillar. So the reason why this thing is totaled is not just this damage, but it tweaked the whole chassis of the car, which is why the roof's all messed up and the sunroof is actually broken too. What is this hole in the dash here? Ah, what I think happened was they tried to install whatever this switch was. But then there's too there's... much behind it. They couldn't. <laughs> there's oh. like, so they couldn't do it. So then they had to drill another hole. They're so bad. <laughs> I heard there's a guy on the internet that did a real good job installing a switch like this. He's been a mechanic for 900 years. Oh. Um, he must have saw that video and like used it as an example. If you've owned this car, did let you... us know how you made this hole. Did you cut it with it? We're dying to know. Paul and I got money on this situation here. Now our car runs and we need to make sure it actually drives. So what we're gonna do is button this thing up and take it for a test drive. We can't swap a drivetrain into a car not knowing if it actually runs through the gears, doesn't fall apart while we're driving it. The other important thing is all the seat belts are blown so they're all locked up and we have no doors. We just gotta hold on real tight. But we're just Jeep bros now, so. It's a Jeep thing, you wouldn't understand. I wouldn't understand. We wouldn't understand. Okay, nothing to do but to step behind the wheel of this thing. Now I got a seat belt. Hey, I got a driver's door malfunction. Oh, sh We're doing it. Here we go. This is this fine. Don't worry. Hey, don't worry. This isn't unsafe at all. Hey, look at I'm a Jeep dude now. Hey, I'm driving around with my foot out the door. Got my foot out the door. Oh, hey, guys. Is the temperature reading correct? Oh, yeah, 31 out. That's North Carolina cold. That is Arctic tundra, friends. The good thing is, is it does actually drive pretty well. Drives nice. Shifts good. Sounds good. Going 13 miles an hour getting our burbles. Oh boy. Bye bye. Transition. All right. So the good thing is the car does drive. Obviously we can't take it out and really thrash on it, which is a bummer, but so far I'm happy. I think we got a good starting point. Paul's happy. I'm happy. 
everybody's happy. With so much happiness going around, it is time for Juan to knock these welds out of the park. Pretty much done as far as prep work goes. So I can take this off and start prepping the inside. Say bye-bye. It's the last time you'll see it like that. He's using expensive rags to clean up glue. So this here, guys, is a uh, CTR9 by Carliner. It is a resistance welder. Basically, in a nutshell, it uses current, heat, and clamp pressure to make two metals marry each other. For some of you guys, maybe not marry each other because there is divorce, but no, it basically fuses two metals together. One of the best machines on the market, in my opinion. Definitely stand behind this thing. Cool. <laughs> Here, Charles. Yo. Come pull one, man. Come pull one? Yeah. All right, so walk me through this thing so, while I... This is gonna be your knee. Right here. All right, First we're gonna knee. pick this up. Yep. This is actually the medium size one. We had two other ones on there that were, that big were, boys. that were the big boys. Okay. Those are the ones that have me sweating, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't work out, He's so. a professional, that's why he's jacked yeah. from. See, I don't work out, but I do work. <laughs> You're gonna about to see how heavy this thing actually is when I try and pick it up, and I'm so, like, oh! yep. doesn't matter. In the beginning, just when you're holding yeah, it. When you've done it the entire day. <laughs> so your trigger is gonna be right here. Okay. And so I gotta pull, push, pull, no, push your just thing. Pull, just push that thing. Okay. And hold. It's gonna do its thing. Is there anywhere hold I shouldn't it? put my hand except like right between yeah, the don't contact? Put it in between there. That's a bad. That's yeah. a dumb. That's a dumb choice. Pull the trigger. Hold it. You're committed. I missed. Misfire. You're committed. <laughs> Look at that. I'm a professional now. So all this right here was glued on okay. and welded on along with the backside. Nice. So pretty much this is now... It is now part of the car. He's going to yank the whole car off the lift. He's so strong. Yeah. And this is what makes Volkswagens really, really, in my opinion, very safe is that they like to use glue and weld. It's a very stout, yep. strong, um, kind of set up. It's because a lot of the cars just, it's all one piece. Like this car was totaled out because of this damage and this is why, because it's a lot of work to fix it. Okay, so this is really cool to see. First of all, this is the kind of stuff you don't normally get to see. Also, the tubes of those glues were stupid expensive, as you can imagine, proper German repair stuff. But he's gluing on that support bracket right now, then come back and do that spot weld thing that you've seen a bunch of. And I gotta tell you guys, this is awesome. You'll never see that stuff again. We'll have just the panel on, we'll wanna weld it all up, it'll get painted, and then we'll get the car back to the shop for the hood rat stuff. With the final panel properly signed off on, Juan has a little more grinding and prep work to do before fitting the quarter panel. Not only is the panel welded on, but it's also glued on. This means he has a narrow window of time to get that panel in place before the glue cures. You ready? Let's go. Oh, this is so exciting. All right, car's basically done. Button it up and I'll drive it home. Just like that, my golf is whole again and almost ready to come back home. 
Now we are going to pull the seats out of the RS3 because the RS3 seats are super dope. And what's really cool and random is all the perforations in the seats actually look yellow. So maybe it'll have this weird blendy, cool, meant to be there vibe. But I'm sure there's gonna come along with some wiring that needs to be done because I don't like a cold butt. So we definitely have to have heated seats. Down, yeah, and out, yeah. Oh, look at all the glass under what? the seat. Forever in eternity of this car, we will be finding glass bits. The all track was dirty, but we off-roaded it. Yeah, that this makes is sense. Like, this is odd how much dirt this is. The hardest part of this swap is gonna be integrating it into the car to get the full functionality of a Golf R because he doesn't wanna be driving a new Golf R that has all kinds of compromises. When we did the Jetta, it's an old car. So it, like there's a lot of technology stuff that doesn't matter if it works or it didn't have it anyway. So when you put it in a Golf R, now making these things mate together so that you have a fully functioning Mark 7 R when you're done is really, I think the hardest part. And not my car. Not, not my, my circus, <laughs> not my clowns. Yes. So we're putting this plastic on here. That way, if we got to get it out of the shop for some reason, it's not going to be a swimming pool. We were really great at wrapping. I don't Gangster know if you've rap. seen our work in the past. Paul, Paul, he'll come and put this on your car too, just yeah. like he did for me. I won't. Okay, so we are on our way to the body shop, which is likely going to be the final piece of the puzzle before I get it back. And Paul and I can start the nuts and bolts of our RS3 swap. This is going to be a big moment. And I'm excited. I hope you're excited. It's going to turn out. Oh, <laughs> it's a little different one than the last time I seen it. It certainly is. So the last time we did, we welded on the outer skin, the quarter. Since then, we've primed everything. We put a little bit more color on here. When it does get fully painted, we'll basically just lightly mist a little bit of uh, yellow. That'll give you that appearance of uh, OEM finish. Today, we're going to use our fancy uh, Terrison gun. We're gonna run a bead of seam sealer. Today is uh, protecting the vehicle from uh, atmospheric stuff. Atmospheric. Technical term, atmospheric <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Putting on seam sealer might seem like one of the easiest parts of this whole entire job. However, to do it right does take a good amount of care and finesse. If we leave any gaps or get the seam sealer wrong, that can allow water to go between the panels, causing my car to rust. to replicate as close as we can to OEM outside of a robot doing it. So that's uh, pretty much what we did today. Now that Juan has taken my golf from super smashed to looking awesome, it's time to get it out of his shop, load it up on the trailer and back home to mine so we can get started on the next step of our project, the RS3 swap. Coming up on our next episode, it's not a great start, Charles. Not a great start at all. The whole front of this car is TPF. We got some janky workmanship, too. A jiggle jiggle like this. He's saying nothing and doing even less. Sound the alarm! The batteries are concrete. And big thanks to these partners, including Liquimali and Unitronic, that helped make this entire crazy project happen.